we go, guys. Okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Fulton Street Collective. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We are coming to you live from the beautiful city of Chicago, Illinois tonight. We are proud to present the Heisenberg Uncertainty Players performing Hearts, the band Hearts, 1975 release, Dream Boat Annie. As we do with all of our performances, accompanied by a live visual artist. Tonight's originally scheduled live visual artist, John Ross Wilson, uh, could not be here tonight. So at the, literally the last minute, we had our old friend, great guy, great artist, Ryan Miller jump on board. Give it up for Ryan Miller. So Ryan is in the lower right-hand side of your screen. He's going to be painting and sketching as the band performs. And what you can do is you can buy his artwork on the lower left-hand side of the screen. That is the virtual tip jar. When you noticed when you entered this show tonight, there's nobody collecting a cover charge, no tickets exchanged, nothing for sale. We were making everything accessible to you, and we are going to rely on your generosity and kindness to please support the band, please support the artists, and please support the arts so we can keep doing this. All right, that's that. We're going to start the show because everybody's here and ready to go. Give it up on drums, it's John Wenzel. <laughs> on bass, Dan Parker. <laughs> on guitar, Chris Parsons. <laughs> Trombone tonight is Josh Torrey. <laughs> on tenor saxophone and flute, Natalie Landy. <laughs> and on trumpet and arrangement, John Dorhauer. This is the Heisenberg Uncertainty Players. <laughs>
Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody here in the room, and thank you for everybody out there on the interwebs who are tuning in to watch us. Uh, we are Heisenberg Uncertainty Players in small group form, so just our six-piece version. Uh, and we are playing Hart's 1975 album, Dreamboat Annie, tonight. Uh, it's almost the 45-year anniversary of its American release, uh, so rather fitting for the occasion. Uh, so we're going to play our version of the, the songs for you, but also give a little bit of context and story of the album and its place in history. Um, so the album was recorded in Vancouver, Canada between July and August of 1975 and then was released in September of 1975, but only in Canada. From there, it kind of picked up uh, some momentum, uh, sold about 30,000 copies before they decided to release it in America, which happened on Valentine's Day, February 14th of 1976. Um, from there, it went as high as number seven on the Billboard 200 charts in America and uh, was certified platinum, uh, largely after the success of the singles Magic Man, which you just heard, and Crazy on You. So Magic Man is the first track of the album, also probably uh, one of the two most familiar songs from it, but also the first American single. Um, and it was a song that Anne and Nancy Wilson, the uh, sisters that co-led the band, wrote uh, in kind of response to their family's reaction to them moving away. So Ann Wilson fell in love with a man by the name of Mike Fisher, who was at the time a member of the band Heart. They then moved away, and her mother was kind of upset about it. She was, I think, 20 or 21 at the time. And so her mother would write her and say, like, why are you doing this? Why are you throwing your life away? And this was Anne's way of saying, like, I, I'm, I, I know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm following this, this man. I'm in love with this magic man. Um, the band that recorded the album was the Wilson sisters, Anne on vocals and Nancy on guitar, uh, but it also consisted of Roger Fisher on guitars, mostly lead guitar, um, Steve Fawson on bass, uh, Mike DeRocher on drums, and was produced by a man by the name of uh, Mike uh, Flicker, I believe. Flicker was his name. And he also did a lot of the orchestrations on the album. Um, so the next two tracks we're going to do consecutively as they're kind of pr uh, presented on the album. So we're going to start with Dreamboat, Andy, Annie, Fantasy Child, and then move directly into Crazy on You. Uh, Dreamboat Annie is one of three versions of the song that appears on the album. Uh, this first one is just kind of a short introduction. Uh, but it's kind of used as the main guiding motif that unites the whole album. And then Crazy on You is kind of the other well-known song from it. It was released as a single in the United States and uh, charted pretty highly on the Billboard charts. Um, this was another song that was inspired by Anne's relationship with uh, Mike, uh, her, her boyfriend and former member of the band. Uh, and this was kind of her story of their passionate uh, romance, but also in the face of kind of turmoil and tumult in the 1970s, so uh, in the face of the Vietnam War. And so it's kind of her response to kind of forgetting everything that's going on and just being passionately in love in the moment. Um, and it's one of several songs in the album that kind of embraces her sexuality in a very forthcoming and forward way, uh, which I, I think is one of the significant things about the album, of, of presenting that uh, view of sexuality, but from a, a feminine perspective, uh, which was pretty unusual in rock at the time. Um, uh, let's get right to it. I've talked enough for now. This is Dreamboat Annie Fantasy Child going into Crazy on You.
move on to there to the next couple of tunes. But before we get to that, uh, I want to go over just a little bit of the backstory on Heart as a Band. Uh, the origins of the band started in 1963, so about 12 years before the album came out, where it was uh, the brothers Roger and Mike Fisher, as well as their original bass player, who was the bass player in the band at the time, Steve uh, Fawcett. And they started as a band called The Army in, I think, Seattle, uh, which was somewhat ironic because they actually moved to Canada uh, to avoid the draft. So they were uh, an anti-army band that was playing by the name of The Army. They went through a few different uh, band names. They went to White Heart and then Hocus Pocus for a while before they finally settled on Heart. And the Wilson sisters didn't come in until a few years into the band. So Ann Wilson starts dating Mike Fisher in about 1970 and then she joins the band on vocals. Her sister Nancy joins in 1974 on guitar. Um, so it, it's kind of interesting that Dreamboat Annie is their debut album, but the history of the band had, had such uh, long roots leading into that. Uh, so the next two tracks from the album we are also going to play consecutively, uh, and that'll take us to the end of side one. So we'll play these two, and then we'll take a little break. Uh, but next up is a song called Soul of the Sea, which is one of several tracks that I think demonstrates a lot of Led, Led Zeppelin influence. And specifically from this one, they use kind of a three-part form that follows the, in the same vein as like Dazed and Confused and Whole Lot of Love, where there's this uh, the main part of the tune, and then they go into this kind of extended middle section that doesn't really have anything to do with the main part, but then they come back to the, the main part at the end. And certainly there's a lot of the same kind of British folk influence that Led Zeppelin had in it as well. But that kind of uh, three-part approach to form I thought was, was very unique. Uh, and then the last track on side one is Dreamboat Annie, the, the title track. Uh, this was the one that was released as a single, but the single version also had like a minute tacked onto the beginning to make it long enough for, for radio format. And it's actually just like the first 45 seconds of Soul of the Sea, so I think it makes sense to do them in conjunction with one another. Um, so here we are, Soul of the Sea and Dreamboat Annie. Thank you. 
Thank you.
All right, man. Let's give it for the Heisenberg Uncertainty Players, everybody. Come on, everybody out there. That is the end of side one or side A, depending on your point of view. We're going to take a short 10 minute break and then play side two or side B. It's also that time of night where you can bring out both sides of your banking apps and take care of the band, <laughs> take care of the artist. If you like what you see in here, you can donate to Fulton Street Collective. All right. We're going to take a short, short break. We'll see you in about 10 minutes. Let's give it one more time for the band. This is the, un the Heisenberg Uncertainty Players. Easy for me to say. All right. See you in a few minutes.
All right, we are back. Welcome to side two, side B of Hearts 1975 release, Dreamboat Annie. Please give a warm welcome back to the stage, the Heisenberg Uncertainty Players. Thank you. Uh, so side two kicks off with White Lightning and Wine, uh, which is... Uh, it was never released as a single, but I think a lot of fans of the band kind of wished it, it were. Uh, it's a bit of a rocker, uh, but it's another track that I think exemplifies their approach to uh, kind of embracing a kind of aggressive sexuality. Uh, and so there, there's the lyric, uh, spit you up, chew you out, never want to know your name. Uh, lyrics that you might associate from like a, a, a prototypical male rock singer, but it's kind of cool to hear them come from the fe female perspective here. Uh, but you also can't talk about White Lightning and the wine without talking about the cowbell from it. Um, I think there was like a legitimate fever, and the only prescription for it in the late 1970s was cowbell, because uh, Don't Fear the Reaper came out, I think, in 77. Uh, but this was actually ahead of the curve with the, the cowbell trend. And so my treatment of it here is kind of an extended homage to the cowbell, and this is going to feature our percussion section with John Wenzel.
So I wanted to take a minute to talk about the recording studio that was home to the Dreamboat Annie Sessions, uh, because it kind of became kind of like a little Canadian Abbey Road in the way that its legacy kind of lived on. Uh, so the, the band was an American band. They were mostly based in the Pacific Northwest around Seattle, but they did move up to Vancouver shortly before recording the album. Uh, and by all, most accounts, it seemed like it was almost exclusively because a couple of the members were trying to avoid the draft uh, for Vietnam. So they went to Vancouver to get away from that, but they ended up uh, being, being a part of the music scene there for a while and recorded at Mushroom Studios. Um, Mushroom was the, also the name of the label that put out the, uh, the album in Canada, and then they opened a U.S. branch in order specifically to release the Dreamboat Annie album in the United States. Um, but Mushroom Studios kind of uh, became a, a, a bit of a, a hotspot for recording after that, and uh, a lot of Canadian bands used it to record, most notably Bachman Turner Overdrive and Sarah McLaughlin had used it. Uh, it was also used to record a lot of film scores. Uh, most notably, it recorded at least a couple Chuck Norris films. Um, and so that puts it on the map, if nothing else. And there was also a period of about 10 years in the 2000s where it was owned by one of the founding members of Marcy Playground, if you remember them from the 1990s. So it was, it was kind of like this big Canadian hotspot, um, which was fascinating beyond all, all reason for me. Um, a little bit more on their label later, but for now we're going to keep going uh, with track seven from the album, Love Me Like Music, I'll Be Your Song. And of all the tracks on the album, I think this one is the biggest outlier. Um, it's the one that is uh, most pop influenced, I think, but there's also a fair amount of country western influence, uh, all while kind of being a power ballad. Um, and we've maintained some of that feel here in this presentation of Love Me Like Music, I'll Be Your Song.
Uh, there was a clap along part I forgot to mention. So if you miss that at home, just rewind, go back, clap along with us. We'll feel a lot better in retrospect. Uh, so we got three more tracks on the album, but we're going to do them all continuously. Uh, so this, this will be the last time I gab at you for the evening. So you're welcome. Uh, <laughs> but before we get to the last three, a little bit more backstory uh, on what happens with the band after. So their label, Mushroom Records, um, kind of has a, a bit of a spat with the band. Specifically, the band, after selling uh, millions of, of copies of the album, felt that they uh, merited a higher share of royalties for the recording contract, and Mushroom uh, labels uh, refused to budge on it. And so it kind of led to this impasse where the band ends up actually breaking their contract and going with a different company. Uh, but one of the things that fueled that uh, dispute was apparently when negotiations, negotiations were getting pretty tense between the band and the label, uh, the label, without consent from the band, purchased an ad in Rolling Stone, I think a full-page ad, that was the image of the Wilson sisters uh, bare-shouldered, like on the album cover, but with the caption that said, it was only our first time, uh, which the band was uh, rightfully offended by, being as that is a very misogynist uh, and, and sexist ad to take out. Um, and so uh, that was kind of the last straw with them. So it led to this dispute where contractually Hart was uh, obligated to provide one more album. And so they did kind of a let it be situation where the label kind of like procured these half recorded songs and some live takes that they had at their disposal and put it out in an album called Magazine. And the band actually like filed an injunction that they won that said they, they had to halt production. They ended up going back and re-recording the songs on it, but it, it was this big, messy situation uh, that ended up working well for the band. Mushroom Records kind of fell by the wayside, so uh, screw them, they got what came to them. Um, I also want to say just a, 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 a couple of words on why I chose to do the album here. Number one, it's a great album, and it's one that's really grown on me over the years, and if you haven't heard it, dear Lord, what are you doing here? Don't waste your time with listening to any more of this, stop it, listen to the album, then come back, maybe and listen to the rest of this. Um, but musically, I, I think every song is uh, top-notch, cover to cover on the album. But I'm also really fascinated by it because it's uh, an album that has kind of a unified whole without really being a concept album. Um, so it's not like Tommy or anything like that where it like, follows this narrative all the way through, but there's a lot of motivic development and a lot of thought put into the assembly and construction of the album. And I'm really fascinated when the, a rock album can uh, strike that balance as delicately as Dreamboat Annie does. Um, and so you have that with the recurring motive, but also like there's a lot of uh, musical tie-ins from song to song as well. Um, and, and, and so it's, it's always kind of fascinated me in that way. And hopefully this piques your interest to either listen to it again or listen to it for the first time. So the last three songs, we'll start with Sing Child, another song that bears a lot of Led Zeppelin uh, influence, and this is kind of the hard-rocking Led Zeppelin song. Uh, sounds to me a lot like Heartbreaker, which is kind of funny because they actually use the, the lyric Heartbreaker at one point in the song, so I'm sure it was a conscious decision on their part. Uh, then we'll go into uh, How Deep It Goes, uh, which is another kind of ballad, but more in like the, the rock ballad tradition. And then we'll close it off with the last version of Dreamboat Annie, the Dreamboat Annie reprise. Uh, and this is kind of like the classical ballad, uh, a lot of lush, beautiful orchestration that we're going to do our damnedest to re-emulate, uh, but it'll all kind of tie everything together. Thank you so much for tuning in. Again, we got three more to go, but we'll, we'll do them all continuously. Uh, I wanted to make sure to thank Chris and Jose and everybody here at Fulton Street. Yeah. Uh, not only for... Uh, having us here and doing a tremendous job, both making us sound good and feel safe in doing it, but also for the, uh, the series of concerts that they've been doing and for their continued efforts to keep live music alive and well in Chicago. So thank you to everybody here at Fulton Street. Uh, I also wanted to thank Ryan Miller, our fantastic visual artist for the evening. I'm looking forward to going back and watching the show so I, I can see his brush strokes in real time, what he's doing. Uh, but, but please support him by his art, tip him, uh, and treat him well. 
Uh, and thank you for all the musicians up here, Josh, Natalie, Chris, Dan, and John, uh, for, for doing such great work bringing this music to life uh, and, and for getting back together. We've, uh, we've been playing as a band for almost 10 years, and it's been really hard this past year uh, not being able to get together and make music, and so this was uh, bringing solace to my soul. So thank you all for, for doing this with us. Um, thank you. Without further ado, the conclusion of Dreamport Eddie.
All right, let's give it to the Heisenberg Uncertainty Players. John Wenzel on drums. Dan Parker on bass. Chris Parsons on guitar. Josh Torrey on trombone. Natalie Landy, tenor saxophone and flute. John Dorhauer, trumpet and arrangements. Let's not forget our uh, man of action who jumped on board at the last second tonight, Ryan Miller on paints and brushes. So that is it for tonight. Uh, speaking of tonight, it's that fancy time of the night where you pick up your fancy phones and take care of the band, take care of the artists. If you like what you see in here, you can donate to Fulton Street Collective so we can keep doing this. We are back here tomorrow night with the Chris Green Quartet. Same station, same time. Please join us then. Uh, this is very much a collaborative effort. Um, let's go for Casey Doyle on sound. <laughs> Harvey Tillis, still photography. Jose Valle on video. <laughs> All right, that's it. Uh, again, thank you for joining us. Please be generous and kind to the band, to the artists, to Fulton Street, and we will see you tomorrow night. Until then, keep your masks on. Thank <laughs> you.